This conference will now be recorded. All right. Uh, thank you very much for joining on a very warm summer day here in Denmark. Uh, the warmest summer day I think we've had yet. Uh, thank you, Susan Weinchek, for joining us from rural Wisconsin, right? That's right. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Susan in person, uh, not only pre-COVID, but something like four or five years ago. Uh, and uh, what happened was that I had been trying, uh, to the best of my abilities, to get Susan to keynote my conferences in Philadelphia or in Aarhus. And uh, Susan having a calendar that was booked something like 18 to 24 months in advance <laughs> uh, made it a little bit tricky. And um, at some point then I received an email saying that, and I think it was reasonably short notice that we're going to be in Copenhagen for these it days. It was probably like three days or notice or something. I think it was, yeah, more than, more than three hours, but perhaps three days. <laughs> And so we're in town and then I kind of turned around and said, why don't you, I happen to be in Copenhagen too, if we can squeeze it in, why don't you become the kind of surprise guest star at a group meeting? So we went to this law firm and I think it was a project managers meeting or something like that. And uh, don't get me wrong, I don't think they had heard about you in advance. And then uh, we started talking about the books Susan has published and they were like, <coughs> they were like, oh, who's in the room? <laughs> And so we basically had a really great Q&A and we talked about how to get people to do stuff and some of the other works you, you've published, uh, things designers should know. And so I remember quite a lot of it actually, and I've been referencing it in a lot of group meetings. So I think I've done my part also in getting the, your name out. Uh, but one of the things that's really stuck with me is the power of the storytelling and specifically the power of the stories you tell yourself. So with that said, why don't I hand it over to you, Susan, and we can get started. And I have a few other questions, and then let's see where the conversation takes us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. One of my favorite topics is the power of self-stories. And, you know, I have a PhD in psychology, and so I have that whole psychology background. But really, it's been, I think, in the last maybe, oh, seven years or so that I really began to get a deeper sense of how powerful self stories are in in uh, directing our behavior and there's a wonderful book i i want to mention not one of my books uh, called redirect by timothy wilson and it's all about his research and other people's research on this idea of self stories but basically what we now know is that it, we are all walking around all the time with stories that we tell ourselves about you know who we are and why we do the things we do and some of these stories are conscious stories that we're aware of. A lot of them are unconscious. We're just not aware we have them. And uh, they really drive our behavior. And we we like our self stories to be coherent, to, to stay the same. Um, we get very uncomfortable when we take an action that goes against some self story we have. Um, and uh, if you really want to uh, get um, especially long-term and large behavior change, basically my reading of the research is you've got to be able to get someone to change their self-story. If, if you don't change their self-story, their behavior um, may change a little bit for a short amount of time, but it's not going to stick. So I've just been really fascinated with the, the research on self-stories and and how powerful an idea this is, you know, not just, I mean, it's powerful in our personal lives. It's also powerful if you're doing, uh, you know, design or, or marketing and you're interested in, in human behavior. Great. Thank you. So I think now is the time to uh, perhaps challenge you to see if we could get an example, like you mentioned at the end, if you're doing design or if you're responsible for a huge corporate initiative to roll out Office 365 or building a website or whatever it is, like, can you just share an example of the, the Jedi mind tricks that you're referencing? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think that a lot of what we do with self stories, we've actually known about, we just maybe haven't articulated it. I mean, if you, I think if you talk to anyone who does digital design or behavior change or, or not even digital design, uh, you know, they'll probably tell you, well, we need to understand who our target audience is. We need to understand what motivates them. We need to be able to give them a message that speaks to 
what they believe. And really, those are all just different ways of saying we need to understand their self stories and we need to be able to talk to their self stories. I think some of the things that are perhaps not as obvious is that um, is how you can get someone to change a self story. You know, so we have these. Let, let's give an example. Let's say that that I'm someone who um, uh, I, I think of myself as someone who likes the newest technology and I like to be savvy about what's coming up and be a you know an early adopter and that's a self story I have whether I realize it or not. I and, think you just nailed like half of the people who's here. <laughs> so you know if that's your self story then if if someone's gonna uh, you know speak to that they're gonna want to latch on to that. They're going to want to give a message that says, oh, you're someone who adopts something, you know, early. But let's say that, let's say that for whatever reason, you wanted to reach people who are not um, the savvy early adopters. You know, you want to, you want to now reach people who are kind of entrenched and do things the same way. And they don't think of themselves as an early adopter. So, you know, can you get them to change that? Do you just give them the message of, we know that you're, um, you know, we know that you're cautious, you know, is it, should you just feed into their self story or can you do something that changes the self story? And, and the, the answer is you can do something that changes the self story. And there's basically a couple things that you can do. One is you can get people to take a very, very small action that goes against their normal self story. So if I think of myself as not an early adopter, if I think of myself as, hey, I don't want to mess with stuff that may or may not work. I don't want to jump in first. So I'm going to let someone else do that. But if you can get me to just try one small thing, if you can get me to try one small app, if you can get a new piece of technology in my hand for a few minutes and have me do something with it, actually now that that I've just I've just gone against my own self story. It's like this is a new gadget. Nobody else is using it. I just used it, and and unconsciously, what's going to happen is that'll just I call it sometimes make a crack in their self story. So they just took a little action that goes against who they normally think they are, and then now once we've established that, now we can perhaps ask them for a, another little action and another little action, another little action, until now that becomes bigger and bigger actions. And what has happened is in order to be okay with that, I have to change my self story. I have to say, oh, maybe I am someone who kind of likes the latest gadgets, right? So what, and once you get that shift going, now you're, you've opened things up um, much wider. So that's one thing that you can do. Another thing that you can do is you can get people to, um, to, uh, uh, if you, it, it's amazing to me that this works as well as it does, but you can get people to like watch a video or listen to someone else talking and they say, yeah, I used to be a person who didn't like new gadgets, but then I tried this thing over here, right? And it's amazing how people will just fall into someone else's self story and not always, but often they'll be willing to put theirs aside and adopt a new one. And then the last thing you can do is a very conscious effort is you can change your own self story. You can edit the story. And um, Timothy Wilson in his book has a very simple technique where you just write down what you think the, the current story is about yourself. You know, I'm someone who doesn't usually like new technology. It doesn't seem to work for me. You write that old story down and then you take a new piece of paper and you say, I'm going to make up a new one. I'm going to make up a new story. I'm a per, I'm smart. I'm savvy. I can handle new technology. I have a lot of experience. And you write yourself a new story. And That's and great. to me, it's just so amazing that this, this idea of self story is so powerful that these small techniques actually can have a big impact. That's great. I see that there's a question here. Uh, before we go to that, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, about the connection between self stories and motivation. Yes. Because I know you've done a lot of work also on motivation. Yes. And the people who are here are obviously very motivated to join what's at, you know, 5.15 on a very warm summer day where they could have been <laughs> at the beach. But uh, not everybody's motivated, just like not everybody are early adopters. Well, I think everybody, actually, I think everybody is motivated. They're just motivated for their own, their, whatever their own self story is. 
So, um, you know, we talk about uh, in the book you mentioned, I think at the top, um, how to get people to do stuff. We talk about seven drivers of motivation. And one of those seven is about so stories and self stories. So I think that uh, to me, the self stories are really one of the major drivers of motivation. Be either being motivated to do something or being motivated not to do something, either way, you're really driven by those self stories. And that's why it's so powerful to, you know, instead of just trying, you know, I, I, I give, Q&A and talks on, you know, habit and that uh, automatic conditioned responses. Um, however, if you want to really change your behavior, if you want to be motivated in a certain way, the best thing you can do is investigate what is that self story and how might I change that self story? And then that will automatically motivate you. You won't have to get yourself revved up because the self story is unconsciously driving the behavior. That's great. Thank you. So let's pass it over to you, Mark, first, and then Hillary next. Perfect. Thanks, Janus. Um, so my question actually relates to to stories and storytelling, especially. So, uh, I mean, I'm in sales. Storytelling is my business, right? So I'm always telling stories and uh, I love doing that. And what I found out is that when you take on a new job, you don't have stories. It's like you can't really sell by the product you're talking about, you can't sell it with the stories around it. So you have to build your your stories through with with uh, experience. Sometimes a lot of what I what I try to establish is a library of stories that other people can acquire. So let people just write down stories that they experienced. And what I found super hard is acquiring those stories and make them your own. Do you have any tips around that? Well, you know, there's a, um, I, you know, obviously self stories and storytelling are related, uh, uh, but they are also kind of their own science uh, separately as well. And, um, you yeah, know, we know that, that the normal way that the brain processes information is in narrative or story form. And so there's been some um, uh, very interesting research on um, the brain chemistry of stories, and uh, uh, I don't know if you know Paul Zark. Uh, I'm sorry, Paul Zak, Z-A-K. Uh, he's done some interesting research on studying the traditional uh, story arc, and then mapping that to uh, oxytocin and dopamine and cortisol. So I think uh, there are some real basic things that we can do when we're when we're creating stories or telling stories. Uh, or trying to get people to identify with stories that will help people connect. So you know, you want to have um, a protagonist. You can have an antagonist, which is the bad guy, but typically it's better to have a protagonist. You want to build in the setting. You want to uh, have there be a rising action. Um, and what we find is that if you tell the story according to um, what actually was identified hundreds of years ago, but we didn't understand why in terms of brain chemicals. But if you tell the story according to a certain arc, it makes it more likely that people will attach onto it. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's pass it over to Hillary. You just hold it one sec, Hillary. There you go. So my question is um, is actually not about the self story in particular, but about getting the desired results. So if somebody's not an early adopter, it would seem to me to make more sense to show them others who tried that technology to reassure them that they don't have to be an early adopter. And that would be just a sh much quicker, faster, more effective way to get them to adopt a particular technology than to change their self story about not being an early adopter. Yeah, so let's look at that, Hillary. So you're saying instead of trying to get them to be an early adopter, instead of trying to change that story, then yeah. tell me what what is it you're you you're saying to it do? Be, I mean, nobody's num adopter number one. 
right? So it would be to find the very earliest adopters and just show them, don't worry, other people have tried this and they've had great success, so you can too. So they can adopt the technology without changing their self story. Yeah, yeah, I think what you're doing there is really, well, it's interesting. Yeah, you don't have to change the self story in that case. In that case, what you're doing is just making it clear to them what is the self story that they already have mm -hmm. that works in this situation. Yes. Um, and so that's absolutely, that's that's very effective and probably, you know, possibly in some cases easier than changing the self story, as long as you can do that. Sometimes, you know, it's like, well, if they stick with the self story, it's just not going to work that they're going to use this product. But yeah, right. yeah that, like, and for so example, that, if a company is changing technology to do their timesheets or do their health yeah. insurance plan or any of that, then they have to do something new and it has to be new because it's new to everybody. But I, I agree with you. I think one of the, the mistakes that we sometimes make is we don't investigate enough. Um, you know, what really is the story we're asking people to have? What mm -hmm. is the story? What are mm -hmm. the stories that this target audience already has can yeah. we just feed can we just feed right into that they, we don't have to make them change anything we just got to help them make that connection between yeah. their current self story it works and the behavior we're hoping they engage in they just might not be obvious and in fact they, they might think they have to change their self story and they might be resisting that maybe yeah. the easiest way is Oh, you know, you're hey, what you believe about yourself fits really well with what we have. Yeah. Good point. Yes. Yeah. I'm a content strategy consultant and there's so much change management in in what I do. How people yeah. make their content better requires them to learn about the audience and to get outside their comfort zone yeah. and to do things in a different and better way. And I know it's better and they're tremendously resistant to change. Yeah. So uh, that's where my question sort of comes from. Well, and that, you know, that's another interesting thing too, right? Because there is, there are some people whose self story is, I don't like change. <laughs> you know, and so if that's the self story, that's one of the toughest ones. I mean, uh, Guthrie and I are, have a client where pretty much the entire target audience is a target audience of people who don't like change. <laughs> so that's been a, that you know that makes for an interesting challenge. All right, let's. Uh, thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Susan. Let's jump to uh, Max. Can you unmute? And yes. Very briefly, introduce yourself. Yes, hi, hi everyone. I'm uh, my name is Max. I'm also based in Wisconsin. Um, I'm in oh. Milwaukee. I'm in Milwaukee. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, and I'm uh, I work in marketing, and um, I I thought this was very interesting. And I, I had a question for you, Susan. Um, one of one of like our clients is trying to ex expand their brand awareness. Uh, one of their goals for the next year is to expand their brand awareness in, for the Hispanic audience. And um, so I guess I was just kind of curious and I want to ask you like, how much do you think um, like culture and demographics can impact like self stories? Do you think that that uh, makes a big difference or not really? I think it can. I think mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we, we bas basically have this balance, right? We have this whole idea of culture Mm -hmm. uh, and de demographics, mm -hmm. and you know there are things that we can say about uh, you know different uh, age cohorts. There are things we can say about you know people who live in the U.S. versus people who live in Asia or Europe. On the other hand, we are all humans, right? And right. we there's a lot that we share, and there's a lot of individual differences. So I think one of the trickiest things when you're doing this kind of work is to decide for the particular behavior change you're hoping to instigate or encourage, which of the factors is gonna be the most important? You know, is cultural a, really a big part of it? Is demographics a big part of it? Or should we just forget that and just go for the you know, fact that we're, we're all humans and you know, there, here's a shared set of values that has mm -hmm. to do with the, the, the product that we're, or service that we're, we're trying to promote. 
So I don't think there is one easy answer. And I think, you know, it's probably one of the things that makes our work the trickiest. So typically what we'll do is, you know, we'll, we, um, uh, we have a whole uh, process uh, called the behavioral design process where we go through. And, and, and one of the main things is just to say, okay, let's be real here. Who are these people? What do we know about them? What do we not know about them? What is it you're trying to do? And then which of the, all of these ideas, you know, a self stories or cultural story or demographic story or individual story, which of these is likely to be the most effective and successful in this situation with this target audience at this time? Okay. That's very good. Thank you. I think this also connects uh, with one of the things you spoke about when we met in Copenhagen uh, five years ago uh, on how many organizations do personas wrong. I know yes. I'm oversimplifying it, but uh, I think this, I was reminded of this when you talked uh, and answered Max on, you know, this trick is the trickiest thing is to decide. Uh, which of the factors are the most important. And so often on personas, at least that's what you said, you see factors that really have no impact. Yeah, they're just not that important or they're not going to be that useful or mm -hmm. or you haven't even verified them. So you have this whole picture of who these people are and what's important to them. And that's actually not what's really important to them. You know, I'm reminded of an example where we worked with a big box retailer a couple of years ago. And we were trying to uh, that what the what the client wanted to do was they wanted to get people to uh, purchase the in-home installation service of the TV. Okay, that was I mean, it was it was nice in that it was a very specific goal. How can we get more people to purchase that add-on when they buy a TV? And so they had all these they had done so much persona work and. You know, they had all this self-story work and they had the company had done all this. And I said, well, let's verify some of these before we make decisions. Let's let's move forward. And one of the most interesting things that came out of that was uh, we did these one on one interviews with with the target audience. And what came out of that was that the most important variable and the most important self-story and, and motivator was when you had a, a 40 something um guy who was the dad and the father and and he he was he i mean the, the depth of emotion i was sitting in the in the observation room going oh my god i had no idea right i i mean i just said no. the, these guys were just about in tears just about in tears during an interview saying it's my job i mean it's my job to get the new TV and get it to work for the kids and the family. And if I can't do that, I have failed. I mean, they were, I was like, it was so emotional and nobody, I mean, I guess, you know, in retrospect, of course people would feel that way, but that was not in their personal library, you know, that that was the self story. So that really taught me that, you know, assumptions, you gotta watch out for those assumptions. That's great. And then let's pass it uh, to the Netherlands. Casper, uh, you have a question on notching. Yeah, because um, in the end, you're you're trying to influence behavior, right? I mean, uh, 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 self stories is a great tool to uh, explain behavior or or analyze it. But in the end, uh, for instance, with the example you gave, Janus, about uh, people onboarding and getting them to use new tools or new technology, is this that behavior that you're trying to stimulate or you're, you're trying to get people to do stuff, literally. Um, and um, I've become quite enamored with the theory of nudging, which I think ties in with self stories as well, uh, where you, you know, just yeah, uh, get people to to take the other fork in the road, just, just uh, nudge them a bit, uh, small change, very small change, but then in, you end up with different behavior in the end uh, down the road. Um, so I was wondering what your views are on, on nudging and, uh, and if you have any tips or, or hints uh, how to apply those uh, uh, techniques. Yeah, yeah I, I, prob I, I won't throw this to you, Guthrie, but I probably should. Yeah, Guthrie is a, our in-house behavioral economist and he's the one that really knows about nudging. 
But um, yeah, I would say basically to me, and maybe uh, Guthrie may, may, or not, may or may not agree, to me it, it's a slightly different terminology, but we're really talking about the same thing because we're talking about, you know, when you're nudging, you're getting someone to take a small action, um, but it can have big consequences. And what you're doing is you are um, uh, changing the situation, the environment, the uh, what's obvious, what's not obvious, in order to encourage people to take that small action. And I think that, uh, you know, in my view, and this is probably just my, you know, psychology roots showing up, you know, basically what I think is happening is what, that when you do nudge someone a little bit and they take a different behavior, that then changes the self story a little bit. And so now they're they're on this path a little bit more than they were before, or they're on this path and they weren't on it before. And so then I think you, you know, again, that that now just makes it easier and easier and easier to open that path up more. So, Guthrie, do you want to just step in here at the closing <laughs> and uh, totally contradict Susan, or yeah, are you, you more that. in He's favor? Done that before. Uh, no, I will not contradict, but I have a small nuance, um, which is uh, so. Uh, Dr. Richard Thaler, who wrote the book Nudge and kind of coined the term, um, he liked to describe nudges in, in interviews as uh, like GPS directions. So it's sort of pushing you in a certain direction, but it's sort of, but the idea of a nudge is it's actually helping you go the direction where you want to end up. So um, you can turn a different way anytime you want. You're free to sort of do what you want, but it's sort of helping you go in the same direction. And that if you are trying to um, get people to go in a place they don't want to go, that's not really a nudge, according to him. I mean, it's all semantics, but that's more of a manipulation or, you know, a changing of behavior. So I do think um, sometimes when people say nudge, I think they mean nudge. Like, I want to stop eating junk food. And so we're going to, you know, let's put the snacks on the high shelf so it's harder to get to. That's like a little nudge. And then there's more uh, behavior modulation manipulation which is a little bit different um so it, it kind of depends which one you're which one you're talking about so if you're doing behavior change then yes susan i totally agree with you all right thank you wow excellent uh finishing on a high note on notching thank you everybody who joined us uh but a big thank you in particular to you susan great to see you again that's all we had for this teeny tiny teaser into self stories okay. uh, there are books written on the topic there is uh, one of the authors of books on the topic is on this call. Thank you, Susan, for joining us. And uh, I'll, um, I'll do my very best to write up the notes from this fascinating conversation. Thank you once again, Susan, for finding your time. Okay. And thank you, everybody, for joining us from uh, more or less around the world. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.